Hello everyone and welcome to this third part of the MOOC dedicated to the crude oil atmospheric distillation. In the first two videos, we talked about the composition of crudes, the salting and the prey train. The following steps will now be described once the crude has been vaporized at a temperature of 385 degrees C. I remind you that the crude has been partially vaporized in the furnace at a temperature of 385 degrees C. At this temperature and at a pressure of 3 bar G, about 70% of the crude is vaporized. This means that about 344 tons per hour of gas and 158 tons per hour of liquid enter the column. This column is typically equipped with about 30 to 50 trays. In our case, we will consider 32. Like any distillation column, it is equipped with a condenser, a reflux drum, and reflux pumps. The naphtha will be the overhead product, or excess of reflux, and the kerosene, light diesel, and heavy diesel cuts will be withdrawn from the column at tray 7, 16, and 22. The column top pressure is typically controlled above atmospheric pressure to a value of about 1 bar G. The pressure drop in the overhead circuit leads to a pressure at the head of the tower of about 2 bar G. Then, the pressure profile in the column leads to a flash zone pressure of between 2.5 and 3 bar G. The mixture of molecules in liquid plus gas form enters the flash zone of the atmospheric distillation column. The vaporized molecules rise in the tower, whereas the molecule in liquid form will naturally go towards the bottom of the column. The feed tray will be tray 27. In other words, the feed arriving in liquid plus gas form enters the tower between the tray 26 and the tray 27. Unlike a conventional distillation column, atmospheric distillation is not equipped with a reboiler. The upward vapor phase in the bottom of the column is ensured by stripping steam which is injected at the bottom of the column. The purpose of this stripping steam is to ensure an ascending gas flow and to strip the heavy diesel molecules that would remain in the bottom liquid. Typically, we will inject about 10 to 20 kg of steam per ton of atmospheric residue. In our case, this corresponds to a quantity of stripping steam of about 2.5 tons per hour. On this graph, we see the evolution of the gas flow that arrives on each tray in the tower. On the trays 32 to 27, the gas flow arriving on the trays is small and corresponds to the stripping steam of the bottom of the tower, which strips the lighter hydrocarbons from bottom liquid. When the upward gas flow arrives in the flash zone, it is mixed with the 344 tons per hour of gas from the feed. This is the reason why on tray 27, there is a jump in the gas flow of about 350 tons per hour. Then, the gas rises in the tower and its flow increases as it goes up in the tower. The upward gas vaporizes the lighter hydrocarbons of the liquid that it will cross as the gas rises. Thus, on tray 1, 630 tons per hour of gas arrive. The gas leaving tray 1 has a flow rate of about 450 tons per hour. This vapor will be fully condensed in the overhead condenser, which is represented here by an air condenser. As soon as the temperature drops in the air condenser, we will condense the hydrocarbons, but also the stripping steam that was injected at the bottom of the column. This water, which condenses, will become saturated with HCl, which may have been formed despite the effectiveness of the desalter and injected caustic soda. The first drops of water that condense will be highly concentrated in HCl and will be very corrosive. To manage this corrosivity, additives are typically injected to neutralize HCl and to protect piping and downstream equipment from the overhead zone. The pH of the condensed water is controlled at the top of the column to a value of about 6. This corresponds to an optimal management of the corrosion phenomena. Finally, hydrocarbons are separated from the water in the reflux drum. 
The temperature of the reflux drum is typically between 40 and 50 degrees C. This depends on the ambient temperature, since in general gas is cooled with an air cooler. Some of the molecules are withdrawn, and this will be the naphtha molecules. What is not withdrawn is re-injected into the column, and this is called the reflux. In our case, we set this flow rate of naphtha at 112 tons per hour, which corresponds to a cut point between naphtha and kerosene of 150 degrees C. This naphtha will generally be debutanized before being routed to a storage tank. To debutanize, it simply means that we will remove light compounds from C1 to C4 that would lead to a product with a too high volatility to be stored. Note that the flow rate of naphtha withdrawn is generally not chosen directly. It is indeed preferred to control the overhead temperature of the column, which will set indirectly the flow of naphtha and thus its cut point. In our case, to extract 112 tons per hour, or to aim for a cut point of 150 degrees C, since it's in the same thing, it will be necessary to specify in the control system a value of 144 degrees C as an overhead temperature. This value is obtained by calculation using a process simulator. Like we said before, 452 tons per hour of overhead gas enters the condenser. 4 tons per hour of water condenses, it results from the stripping steam injected at the bottom of the tower and the residual water leaving the desalter. Then, 112 tons per hour of naphtha will be withdrawn. There remains 452 minus 112 minus 4 equals 336 ton per hour of liquid that we will re-inject in the tower. This is called the reflux. This time, on the graph, we show the liquid flow leaving each tray. The 336 tons per hour reflux at the top of the column acts like a sort of quench when it meets the ascending gas flow. This is the reason why liquid leaving tray 1 has a flow rate of about 500 tons per hour, which is much more than the 336 tons per hour reflux rate. At tray number 7, we extract the kerosene. As we saw in the first video, we will extract here a flow rate of 94 tons per hour, which corresponds to a 250 degree C cut point between kerosene and light diesel. It's up to the panel operator to set the kerosene rates he wants. It can be seen from this graph that the flow of liquid drops by about 100 tons per hour on tray 7, since 94 tons per hour of liquid is removed from the column. The kerosene withdrawal temperature is 230 degrees C. We will see later that this is an important parameter. At tray 16, light diesel is withdrawn from the tower. If we aim for a cut point of 300 degrees C between light diesel and heavy diesel, this implies to withdraw 37 tons per hour of light diesel. And we clearly see the drop of liquid flow by 37 tons per hour on the draw-off tray. The light diesel withdrawal temperature is 300 degrees C. We will speak more in details about this temperature in the next videos. Same thing on tray 22, where the heavy diesel will be withdrawn. A flow rate of 56 tons per hour for a cut point of 350 degrees C between heavy diesel and residue is considered. The heavy diesel withdrawal temperature is 330 degrees C. We see that the tray where we have the least liquid flow is the tray located just above the feed tray. In our case, we see that this liquid flow is about 75 tons per hour, or about 15% of the distillation throughput. Finally, in the bottom of the column, to complete our material balance, we have 201 tons per hour of atmospheric residue coming out of the tower. This residue is withdrawn at a temperature of about 370 degrees C. Now that we have a distillation column that corresponds to the cut point we arbitrarily set, the question you may now ask yourself is, but is this really optimized? 
can we better arbitrate the quantity of naphtha, kero, light diesel and heavy diesel? We will see that in the fourth video. See you soon and thank you for your attention. But in the meantime, do not forget to test your knowledge with the quiz available in the description of the video and subscribe to my YouTube channel Refining is Exciting. See you very soon for the fourth part. Bye-bye.